Welcome back to the Comics Cube, everyone. Today, I am back with Carl Kiesel, and we were we are talking about Impossible Jones 2B, which teams up <laughs> Impossible Jones and Captain Lightning. Welcome back. Uh, great to be here. My <laughs> first question is, has nothing to do with Impossible Jones. What did you think of King Shark in the Suicide Squad? Oh, I was, I was thrilled. I was thrilled to see him in Suicide Squad. It was a joy every moment, you know. Uh, I really enjoyed that that movie a lot. So, King Shark and and Harley Quinn. How did that feel for you? Well, of course. I mean, I just can't. I'm not Johnny come lately to Harley, but I do feel yeah. a certain connection to her. Um, no, I mean those two. You know, one of the things I really liked about Harley in that movie was when uh, when she's like she, when she goes on her little spree and like flowers start going all over. Yeah. And I, I like that it showed kind of how she sees the world. That's how I saw it. You know, I, I go, oh, this is how she sees it. She doesn't see gouts of blood. She sees flowers and little animals and stuff like that. And uh, quite honestly, that jibes with how I tried to portray Harley. Because I, I have to say, I had, a, I had a big problem portraying a, a mass murderer as a hero. Because, I mean, she she's killed lots of people, you know? Um, and so I, I, it felt, I felt very... Uh, um, I... I I felt it was very important to show that she didn't real, and she's insane, right? So it yeah. was important to show that she doesn't realize the uh, the mayhem she's causing in, in some level. Um, I, I think it's it's the only way a person like me could uh, could write her book, quite honestly. I mean, there's other people that probably wouldn't wouldn't face, but I'm old school enough that that really bothered me. I agree. And so I was actually kind of I was kind of thankful to see James Gunn do something similar in in the movie. You know, he didn't worry about showing, you know, King Shark, you know, seeing little puppies or something because King Shark is a shark. You know? <laughs> so, I mean, it's kind of in his nature to, to chomp on things. Um, so. And yeah. are you sad that he made they made him, a, you know, a, a regular shark and not a hammerhead shark? No, I mean, I, he was a regular shark when I created it. Yeah. Then he became this hammerhead, which was kind of freaky. But um. I, I, I believe there's power in, um, in those real primal images. And the primal image of a shark is the great white, right? Mm -hmm. it's, the hammerhead is, you know, when you find out about a hammerhead shark when you're a kid, you're like, what? That's like the weirdest animal I've ever seen in my life. But I mean, the iconic image of a shark is the great white. Yes. So Sorry. congratulations on that. I'm really glad. Now we know, and you have made this public, um, <coughs> the reason that you're not jumping straight from Impossible Jones number one to Impossible Jones number no what will now be impossible Jones number three is because King shark has given you the funding. Yeah, I did. I got a, I got an unexpected royalty check that gave me a little padding. Um, and so, you know, David and I were able to step back a little bit. Um, and instead of going basically from what would be impossible Jones, the movie to impossible Jones to the movie, we're, we're kind of doing this uh, TV mini series in between. You know, uh, a limited edition four part, uh, you know, shorter stories, more intimate stories, more smaller scale stories that uh, team uh, Impossible Jones with a character from her universe. And we've already done the uh, first one, which teamed her with Holly Days. Which and is that's, excellent. I'm, I'm glad you like it. I'm, I'm very proud of that book. I think David did an outstanding job. Um, I only have one copy of it here. It's the one with the... Uh, the the Dan, Dan Jurgens cover. I mean, I, I was getting ready to talk to you, and I go, I don't have any Impossible Jones stuff here, but this was sitting <laughs> nearby. But um, you know, this is with her and Holly, and this book yes, is done, yes. and I'm in the middle of fulfilling it right now. I mean, really, literally in the middle. I've shipped out half the boxes that have to go out, and um, but this will be followed by Impossible Jones. What we're calling Impossible to B which is um, the second part of the four-part team-up books. And the second one will team her with Captain Lightning, which is another character from her universe. And is a character I created in second grade when I couldn't draw legs. So he just had this lightning bolt where his legs would be, you know? So. If I remember right, Captain Lightning's kind of based a little bit on the Green Lantern, right? His costume is based yeah. on Green Lantern because it's a, a costume I love. I think that's one of the best two, two one of the two best design costumes in the business. The other is Spider Man's, um, but I lo I've always loved the Green Lantern costume. Just the the cuts in and out, the really dynamic uh, shapes to it, the way it goes on the shoulders. I've just always really loved it. So yeah, you like the thing. <laughs> yeah, <the shape. laughs> I don't know what to call it. 
Yeah, I, it's that in and out V shape. I don't know. Yeah. It, it's it's a really dynamic shape. It, it just works really, really well. So. And what is it with about uh, characters with lightning on their chest? It's just a dynamic. It's a, it's a go to thing, right? From I, Shazam to the Flash to Madman to. I know, and that made that made it really hard to come up with a chest symbol for Captain Lightning because, like, when I was a kid, he just had a lightning bolt, you know. But I wanted to come up with something a little more memorable, and uh, he's not in this book. I'd show you. Oh well, he's. Yeah. Uh, He's in, this is the Scout comic, which comes out this week. The Scout co copy of Impossible Jones. And that is Captain Lightning over there. And he does show up in here with his chest symbol. And uh, I was pretty, really happy with the symbol that David and I finally came up with. But it was really hard. So, uh, well, okay. Kind of, it's kind of, it's right there. It's kind of hard to see. But it's, big, it's a big triangle with a lightning bolt on half of it. I was going to say, if you couldn't find it, I have this an arm's distance away. Ah, there you go. It's <laughs> so, also in there. Yeah, it's also yeah. in there. So but anyways, I'm, yeah. This, by the way, is now being serialized. So, you know, this was your first Kickstarter. Um, right. And this is now being serialized via Scout Comics. So Right, that's what this out. is. That's what I was holding up. Yeah. That's okay. the first issue, which is in shops this week. It has all new covers. Um, when we can, we fit in some extra interior pages, which... I actually don't go into the story because the story, we, we plotted a pretty tight story. It wasn't like there was a lot of downtime, but there is some extra pages um, in issues two and three, uh, which is called The Big Question, which is kind of like a, a YouTube show in the Impossible Jones universe where okay. this, this yeah. guy asks a big question about one of the characters. And, and you learn a little bit more about the background of, of the city and the characters that are in the city and stuff like that. That so. this is the city that you have obviously thought out well ahead of time because you just pepper in so much detail about the city in the background. I find that fascinating. But yeah, did you yeah, know I, I, for some reason? Yeah, what? Good. yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, there was a time when we were building Impossible Jones that David and I just ex exchanged ideas about the history of the city, and you know, like you know. It, you know, geologically, what we wanted was under the city, there's these caverns that are filled with um, you know, hot mineral springs. And that's a really bad place to build a city on top of caverns. <laughs> but we really like the image. So we're ignoring the science of, of that. Um, and so, you know, the city was started as, as you know, a, a, a retreat where people would go and soak in the mineral waters and stuff like that. But um, then around the turn of like, I can, I don't want to bore you all with all this. Around the, around the turn oh, of the last great. century, around the turn of the last century, all of that, all of that hot um, geothermal power was harnessed in a very steampunk fashion, which made this little retreat into a city, a very steampunky city around the turn of the last century. Um, and then there was an earthquake and it destroyed a lot of the caverns and made the city fall on hard times, which made it ripe for crime to come in because they could use those caverns to bring in like whiskey during the prohibition. So we got this whole thing worked out. Um, and in fact, in the Captain Lightning, the, the imp Captain Lightning book, there's going to be a two page history of New York, New Hope City, where you learn the basic beats of how it got to be what it is today. So two questions. One, when you were making this one, did uh -huh. you know ahead of time that you were going to eventually serialize it? Did not know. I mean, there was always the hope, quite honestly. Um, and because of my training, you know, we were breaking it down into issues anyways. The four chapters are, they're long comic books. They're like 26, 28 pages long. But I mean, they were comic books. They were, they, they were what I would, you know, I mean, if you pick up like the old Marvel comics from the 60s, they're very often 26 pages long. Um, so, so to me, they were four comic books and could stand that way. And when I was writing them, I, you know, just from training, that's how I would always write it. Uh, even the beginning of each chapter, I would try to make sure characters were introduced. So, you know, that's just my training, you know? Yeah. You, you have it down to a science, but when you did that, when you plotted out the entire history of New Hope City, and you're, you know, you're not explicitly saying it until you get to this Captain Lightning issue, does it make it easier? To, does it make what easier? Does it make writing it easier? Because then you don't, you know, you have all of this background knowledge that the reader might not know. No, that's true. But I think that kind of informs the way you play out a scene or something, you know, like, 
you know, if you know there's subways in New York City, that that in some way informs the way you play out a scene, you know, even if characters are not getting in on and off a subway, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you can see, you know, you can see a subway stop. And even though that doesn't maybe have anything to do with the story, it is that, you know, it, it like you said, it's the details that add layers of richness to the city and make it more, more specific and less generic, you know, and because it becomes more specific, I think it becomes more real. Now, uh, Imp and Holly, when in, in the previous comic, uh, they clearly have a very good relationship. They're best friends who have to pretend to be enemies, kind of like Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, and so how is Imp and Captain Lightning going to be like? Because I feel like they don't particularly like each other that much. Yeah, they don't. Um, I mean, I think <clears throat> what it comes down to is Captain Lightning, you know, based on their first run in uh, during the, the graphic novel. Uh, Captain Lightning has has certain reservations about Impossible Jones. He's, he's not 100 percent sure she's all she says she is, but he's the sort of guy who needs proof. So I'm giving you the benefit of doubt, but I got my eye on you. I got my eye on you. And um, in this next story, uh, he, he comes forward to ask her to help. And she figures he's only asking to, me to help so he can like trip me up, you know? That's the only reason he would reach out to me. And uh, yeah, there's a definite tension between the two of them, so. And with Captain Lightning, why does, why does Captain Lightning feel like he's the authority over all of these figures? I think it's just his personality. I mean, uh, he's, he's a very commanding sort. Um, and he thinks, he thinks, you know, in in the world of New Hope, New Hope City, we have a polecat, and he's mostly concerned with people. He wants to make sure Joe down the street is safe. He wants to make sure that Emma can get home from school. He's very concerned about the people. Captain Captain Lightning is concerned about justice. He's concerned about the city surviving and in being a good place to live. He does not know Joe's name necessarily, and he doesn't know about Emma coming home from school, but he wants justice in the city. That's the level he operates on. Um, would, would you say he's based on any particular archetype of a superhero? Is he more Captain America? Or is he more Daredevil scaled up? No, I, I wouldn't say. I mean, obviously, I think Polkett's power-wise very much like Daredevil. But I think Captain Lightning is you know he's in his commanding presence more like a captain uh, more like a captain america or superman he's certainly not on superman's level and he's certainly not a patriotic character like captain america but as far as you know that sense of authority that's the level he operates on yeah what i was getting at with daredevil was you know how daredevil might not necessarily know everybody in hell's kitchen so, so which is why i say it scales up uh -huh. um he's really concerned about his turf mm -hmm. but i feel like he doesn't particularly like people <laughs> <laughs> i guess it depends on the writer yeah <laughs> um and what challenges will uh, imp and and captain lightning face in this one well i mean the basic idea is there is a uh, a meteorite uh, uh that has some undefined power and captain lightning is a is certain in fact it's going to be stolen and so he wants Impossible Jones to help him prevent it being stolen. Um, and she, you know, so, and, and, and the thing here is that he is convinced it's going to be stolen by a group called Section Zero, which is another book I've worked on with Tom Grummet. Wait, I was told there was no Section Zero. <laughs> Well, that's what Impossible Jones thinks, too. That's her first reaction. There is no Section Zero. That's a myth. What are you talking about? And, um, and so she decides if Captain Lightning is convinced someone's going to steal this thing, she might as well steal it because he's going to blame Section Zero. And uh, so that's, that's where the story starts. And, you know, uh, Section Zero does make an appearance. So... So, you know, but that's that's the basic conflict in there. And, and Impossible Jones finds herself, as always, caught in the middle. So Impossible Jones, uh, Captain Light. So you told me the last time that Imp and Holly was a comic that you were proud of. It was fairly easy to write and it just kind of fell into place. This one, as you're describing it, 
I actually thought the words, this writes itself. Is it getting well, easier dude, to write Impossible Jones or is it, or was this the challenge? I mean, does it, well, it writes itself to a certain degree. I mean, I certainly, you know, as, as like any, I, I don't know, most, most stories have a life of their own and this one certainly did. I did not know section zero was gonna be in it until I was looking around for who would want to steal this meteorite. And I figured, well, you know, it's strange, unknown origin, blah, blah, blah. And what, you know, section zero might wanna get that off the market. You know, that's their whole point is they don't want it falling into the wrong hands. Uh, but Captain Lightning feels theirs are the wrong hands. So, now, so that's, 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 you know, that's where the conflict comes in, yeah. When you created Impossible Jones, did, did you ever consciously think, I'm going to set them in the same universe as Section Zero? No, no, I never did that. In fact, I, I was asked that, maybe even by you, and I said, no, I don't think so. Because uh, Impossible Jones is much more like a classic superhero comic in that it, it's very ageless. You know, I can see us doing Impossible Jones stories for decades, and she would always be, what, late 20s, whatever age she is. Whereas Section Zero, from the beginning, Tom Grummet and I made a very conscious decision that they would age in real time. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, I mean, some of the characters in the Section Zero graphic novel, they start out at one age, and by the end of the novel, since it took us 18 years to finish it, they're 18 years older, you know? Um, and so because of that, I, I was always very reluctant to merge the two universes. And then I said, oh, why the hell not? And <laughs> I'm doing it. So is it, are, are they in the same universe or are you treating this as more like, you know how, you know how older cartoons can have guest appearances and stuff, but they're not necessarily always affecting each other? Yeah, I think like, it's more like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the they're, they're realities are crossing right now. Um, but like, what, what was it? What am I thinking of? The Flintstones and the Jetsons. That's what I'm thinking there, of. Is it, I, it, is it like, I don't, oh, gee, there's some comic out there where the main character doesn't age, but he, he would meet up with someone. Then later on, he would meet someone and they were grown up because they had aged, but the main character hadn't. And I forget what, that, I've seen that in comics before. And that, if we ever, I don't know. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to worry about that with Impossible <laughs> Jones in Section Zero. We're just yep. gonna um, have a really good story here, and uh, you know, and go from there. I feel like you're playing uh, loose with, yeah. you know, loose enough with with these rules. Plus, I think the whole very very strict shared universe thing is totally a Marvel thing anyway. Even DC's not that good at it. So, yeah, like because I think you can tell with DC's entire history that they were not made to be a shared universe to begin with. Right. Right. And no, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And, and which is why I think that they go through a crisis every five years. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's it like working with David? Is it is it getting easier? Is it like, do you guys basically read each other's minds at this point? I think, uh, you know, it's always, always a pleasure to work with David, always. And um is it getting easier? I mean, it was never hard. Uh, so I don't know if it's getting easier. I think we're getting better at working with each other because I think we understand each other's language, language more the more we do together. Um, and I think we keep each other honest. I mean, I, I look at David's layouts and I make suggestions where I think something might be a little clearer or something. And David will read my plots and, and uh, scripts over and um, make some very, you know, very important suggestions. I mean, quite honestly, in the imp, imp in the Imp Holly book, there's a two page sequence that was not in the original script. And David was talking to me and he goes, I really think we need this beat in the story. And, and he was right. And which uh, one was it? Actually, it was, um, it's the two pages. You, you've read the book, right? Yeah. It's really right towards the end. It's, uh, Is it's it these two pages that, that show Imp going back to the dead girl's apartment. Those two pages were not in the original script. I have <laughs> that exact page up on my screen right now. Really? Yeah, because I was going to mention the very last shot of that scene where she says us imps have to stick together. And the subtlety in that expression. No, is... David is so good at expression. So good. Right. I, I feel like. I feel like that's difficult to draw. <laughs> uh huh. 
and he pulls it off really seamlessly. So I was going to say, like, what a all of the visual opportunities that you have with a superhero who stretches uh, with this wonderful character design and frankly, a wonderful uh, uh, setting mm -hmm. and just subtle things like these small, slight expressions. I think they're I, I think you got a good partner here. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't be happier. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when we were going to do the second graphic novel to follow the first one, I, I was already working on the Kickstarter and one of the rewards was going to be a, a little mini poster and it was um, for people who supported it in the first 48 hours. So it was 48 little tiny shots of imp from the, the first graphic novel. And, and I was putting that together going, damn, David does great expressions. Look at all, you know, 48 images of, of Impossible Jones from the first graphic novel. And none of them were the same. And there was just wonderful variety. Uh, some of them very cartoony, some of them very serious. You now, David is a master of expression, master. And it's amazing because his work is very simple. So, you know, just the slightest variation in a line can make, you know, a grin into a smirk. You know what I mean? You gotta, yeah. be, you gotta be very careful with it. You gotta, you, you know, as the anchor, you gotta hit it just right or you can lose everything he put down on paper. Do you, do you think it's something it's a skill that is underrated by you know comic book fans because i feel like i don't hear fans going on a lot about how great an artist does an expression unless it's kevin mcguire who you know yeah. that's, kind of, that's kind of his thing so yeah well you're probably you're probably right. i mean you know yeah you're probably right i mean I'm, I'm thinking about when i talk about movies i don't necessarily talk about you know the quiet moments you know the subtle expressions although a lot of times you know, I do think, wow, that was a great moment because I, I saw so much in that actor's expression that wasn't in, you know, in, in the script, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I think, let's face it, in all this entertainment, movies and, and television and comics being primarily visual, what you usually talk about is, you know, wow, Starro was really cool. He was really big. And when, you know, they blew off one of his legs, you know, that's what you talk about because that's, that's the big image. You know, that's the thing you don't see every day. And uh, the, the smaller things, the smaller things are what ground it and they make that Starro moment real and work. You know, yeah. that's, that's the thing. With, without those smaller moments, the bigger moments don't play. You don't have the highlight. Yeah. 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 Speaking of which, I can't believe they made Starro look really, really cute, like a plushie. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually surprised how brightly colored he was. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, and then... <laughs> Uh, we can't talk about a Kickstarter campaign without talking about tiers and rewards. So what do we got for this one? Uh, well, I mean, we got our, our usual uh, round of suspects. You can um, get the book and get uh, we have a signed edition of the book. We will have um, two alternate covers, one by Tom Grummet uh, featuring Section Zero and Impossible Jones, one by John Bogdanov who uh, has done a beautiful homage to a classic Golden Age Superman cover where Superman is in a wing boring pose and he's being hit by lightning, except in Boggs cover, it's Captain Lightning being hit by lightning. And he goes, it tickles. Yeah. And, uh, and Richard Starkings did, a, did up a really great like Golden Age logo for Captain Lightning. So we're really you know paying homage to that Superman cover. Uh, so there's a two alternate covers we have. Um, Tom Grumman and John Bogdanov. I feel like you know these people from. Uh, I've I've, some I've crossed time paths back. with them a few times. So now we've had I've had Dan Jurgens do a cover, Tom do a cover, Bog do a cover. I got to get Butch Geist to do a cover. Then then like I'll have all the old Superman crew have have contributed to Impossible Jones. So that's true. That's the death of Superman crew. It is. Yeah, it's that that's the lineup at the time I joined the books. Yeah. Um, but um, and then we have, you know, you can there's a, there's a few places where people can appear in the comic. That's always a very popular thing to do. Um, we can also have a few, few places where in the background or as a product or place, your name can be included. And uh, in the past, we've had like uh, one of the backers, Mike Solo. We have Solo Beer. And like from now on, when anyone drinks beer in the Impossible Jones universe, it will be Solo Beer. And um, you know, we had another one in the in uh, in this book. Uh, Witzel was was the guy's middle name. It was, and so we have Witzel Schnitzel. It's a food cart. Witzel Schnitzel food cart. 
So, which is actually based on a real food, food cart here in Portland, which serves the best schnitzel sandwiches. So when I saw his middle name was like Witzel, I thought that's perfect, Witzel perfect. Schnitzel. And, uh, and I will say a special reward in the upcoming Impossible Jones uh, uh, Captain Lightning Kickstarter, Imp 2B, um, there's only one of them, only one person's gonna get this chance, but more than once we have showed Imp drinking a soda, but I've decided it's an energy drink. She likes to drink something like Red Bull, but it's not Red Bull. What's it gonna be called? You get to decide. You get this reward level. You and I and David will decide on the name of that energy drink that will be Imp's energy drink that she drinks whenever she's sitting on a rooftop waiting for something to happen, when she goes to the bodega. This is what she's going to buy. This is her energy drink. It's her preferred drink. Someone is going to get a chance. They can name it after themselves. They can name it after their cat. We have certain veto rights because we don't want to have an insulting yeah. name. But uh, that is the reward I am most excited about. I want to see what her, uh, her energy drink is going to be named. <laughs> That's very cool. So everybody, <laughs> you have one chance to one be chance. the one to name New Hope City's energy drink. All right. And of course, we also have uh, David, David and I will be doing some sketches. There's going to be 20 slots open uh, for sketches. We, and those always go quickly. And they're always a lot of fun to do after the campaign's over. I have a few questions regarding uh, Imp and Holly. OK. Um, number one. Are we leading, will you ever do the backstory of the Persephone contest? We, uh, you know, Persephone is this character that I really love. I love the idea of Persephone. I love the idea that every year there's a, a, a pageant where a new Persephone is, is voted on and elected. And she takes the, literally takes the crown and, and she gains powers when she does this every year. The, the Persephone character has certain powers. And we've never had a real spot to focus on it in these Impossible Jones stories. And it's, it's been very frustrating for me. Uh, one of the big question one pagers that will be in the Scout comics is all about Persephone. Um, so that'll be a little glimpse into Persephone. Um, and, and I really wanna focus on her more, but at this point, uh, she has just not naturally worked into the stories and to shoehorn her in is a disservice to the story basically. Is there currently an active Persephone in yes. the Impossible Jones universe? So we just yeah, haven't she, met her. Yeah, I mean, we, we actually did see her uh, in this first issue, but she was sleeping. She did not respond to the huge explosion that creates Impossible Jones. Um, oh, yeah. She's down here sleeping right here. There she uh, is. So, and in fact, you know, later on, she gets a text message with you know, that says something like, where are you? Persephone needed. And she sleeps through it. Um, she's the mayor's daughter. The current Persephone is the mayor's daughter. And the mayor is an ex-Persephone herself. Very so, interesting. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, the idea of, you know, these people have one year in the spotlight and it's, you know, like Miss America. And then what do you do after you're Miss America? And the title gives it, you know, some of them have really parlayed that into something, you know, like the mayor, she par parlayed that into political power. Um, but, you know, some people went off and had four kids in the suburbs, you know, I, I really like the idea of all these different ex Persephone's and what happened to them. I think that's a really fascinating story, stories that could be told. And of course, one of them is Holly Days. And one of them is Holly. And you do, well, we do. You saw a little bit about it here. Yeah. You know, she had to resign in disgrace mm -hmm. and uh, ended up being Krampus's sidekick. Or Is movie. Krampus still alive? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, and as I said, these stories sometimes write themselves. I, th I think you might be seeing them sooner than you realize. Sooner than I realized, put it that way. I was working on some story outlines and all of a sudden I said, oh my God, Krampus could show up here. Hmm. So well, what does it feel like when you get to a moment like that? Um, well, it's very exciting. You know, I mean, a lot of what I do is, is um, I always say, you know, I, I always react to how the fanboy in me feels. And if there's a moment that I think of and the fanboy in me goes, oh, that is cool. You know, I, I generally listen to those moments, you know? So, so so Krampus, the section zero. Yeah, those those when those pop into my head, the, the fanboy in me starts going, yeah, yeah, let's see, yeah, I want to see that. 
So uh, what I find fascinating is, you know, you've clearly been a you've you've clearly been a fan your whole life, right? Sure, sure. But and there is in fact a retro feel to Impossible Jones. It it gives me that retro vibe that I get when I was reading comics for the first time. But when mm-hmm. you were reading comics for the first time, and when I was reading comics for the first time, we're not in the same time. Right. And there is also a very modern feel to Impossible Jones. I feel like you've captured this timeless feel of fun and and coolness. Um, well, well, with thanks. This universe. I, I I would have to say probably any sense of modernity in the book is all because of David. <laughs> David's art is it really brings my sensibilities into the twenty first century. I mean, you know, if you know, I I have to say, you know, um, probably the biggest problem I have as a creator is. I have spent most of my career trying to recreate the uh, the Stanley Jack Kirby comics that I loved so much as a kid, and uh, I really, um, you know, I think in some ways that's held me back. And uh, I think David has helped me pull out of that, where I still have that love, and and I think you can see see the influence on the books. But I think David has helped pull me in, you know, into the twenty first century. You know, I get that. But I mean, the whole cast already is is kind of reflective of a more more modern setting. So you know, Imp for one is one, uh, and the 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 detective, you know, being a Hispanic woman. I feel like I would not have seen that <laughs> in yeah. the comics I read as a kid. Or or if I did, it would be very very rare. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's true. But I think that's also, yeah, that is, like you said, more of a reflection of the days we live in, you know, the times we live in. Um, Yeah. Also, the humor in the book, I feel, is... Well, I think think humor is essential. I I don't want to read a book that doesn't, you know, I mean, you you can be entertained by being scared and you can be entertained by, you know, being thrilled. Um, But but I've always enjoyed laughing. I mean, I, once again, I go back to those Stan Lee stories i i remember specific scenes out of fantastic four and spider-man where as a kid i was laughing so hard i could not breathe i mean literally could not breathe i was laughing so hard and um do you remember a specific scene i there there was one scene with j jonah jameson who was in the hospital he's on the phone trying to talk to the da- trying to get in touch with the daily bugle and the operator he's talking to is not connecting him probably and she's and he's going not beagle i said bugle and and as a kid, I was on the floor, and it's still. I've I've seen that scene recently. It's still a very funny scene, uh, you know. Yeah. And uh, but I, oh, that was such a great scene. So, I I binged the first two hundred issues of Amazing Spider-Man a, a year ago, uh-huh. and like, I think I didn't realize until I read it all in one go how funny Ditko was when he was doing um, J. Jonah Jameson. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I feel even when John Romita got on it. Like he could draw J. Jonah Jameson, but it wasn't as funny because it wasn't as ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. He didn't have so. that big giant grin on his face. Yeah. <laughs> there is a scene in, in Imp and Holly where, you know, she's swinging away from, from the cops when she enters the precinct. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a reporter in the background or on the ground taking a selfie of or a picture of her. Right. Later on, you find out that Holly Days was in the was in the precinct while it was happening. Right. Is that meant to be Holly Days? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Very cool, and I like that you don't spell it out. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's it's clear enough, but that's the whole point, right? right? You know, it's clear enough you can connect the dots, and I think the people that connect the dots, like you, get a little more out of the book. And if you don't connect the dots, the story still works. You know. And I like that Imp never, you know, never remembers that, oh, yeah, there was this person in the precinct because no. she would not have noticed. No, she was just part of the crowd at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the backup story about even Steven. Oh. So how did you end up working uh, with Dan Chicade on this one? Well, I, um, you know, I know Dan because he used to be a member of Paris or Periscope. Well, it was, it was probably Periscope at the time, but now Helioscope, Heliscope. the studio here in, in Portland. And I got to know him there and I just loved, loved his work. It was so wonderful. And, you know, then he moved away. But right before he moved away, we, we had dinner and I said, I really want to work with you at some point. And um, when 
during the Kickstarter, we were looking for stretch goals. And one of the stretch goals was to add, you know, an even Steven backup story, solo backup story, because clearly from what response I got from the, the graphic novel, even Steven was the breakout character. People said, like him, love even Steven, you know, and, and we want to know more about it. And um, we were, you know, moving forward as quickly as we could, finishing the main Impossible Jones story with Holly Days. And David was very uh, booked up with that. Plus he had some other commitments. And I really wanted to just keep moving forward and get the book done and get the book in people's hands as quickly as possible. So with David's blessing, I approached Dan to draw the backup story. And Dan was, he was actually too busy, but he said, I will find time. I will find time. And he handed in the six page story, you know, and it was beautiful and it was right on time. And um, I, I could not be happier. He did a wonderful job. Wonderful job. Yeah. Dan Chicade has a web, a web, a web tune called uh, Lavender Jack. Yes. And it's beautiful. Yeah. He's a man who really understands storytelling on a, on a level that he, I would say I don't. I mean, he, he really, you know, he can look at things and dissect the way a story works. I'm very impressed by it. So I think your storytelling is fine. I, I, I think it's fine too. Um, I, I think my big, um, personally, I think my biggest problem is I am a very instinctive creator. And like I said, if the fanboy in me gets excited, that's, that's, that's a very instinctive reaction. And I think a lot of what I do is very instinctive and not necessarily um, analytical. I don't always know why I'm doing something. And, and I think there can be big drawbacks to that. But there can also be strengths to that, though. It, yes, it there can also more, be strengths. Yeah, I feel like the ones who are more analytical in their writing can come off kind of cold sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, um, I, I, I always think of um, Meryl Streep, who I know is a really wonderful actress, but every time I see her, I think I can tell she's really thought every moment of this scene out. You know, and, and so to me, she's a very intellectual actress, um, whereas I respond much better to Kurt Russell. I enjoy Kurt Russell. I enjoy watching Kurt Russell on screen. Um, and, you know, I know Kurt Russell has said, you know, I'm a court jester. That's what he, he sees his role as. I'm just a court jester. That's what I do. And, um, you know, I, I, I think he's got a certain level of craft. And, he's very, and when I say a certain level, I mean, I, I think it's a really high level. Um, but I mean, there, there's certain things he brings to the table and he knows his strengths and weaknesses and he gets roles that, that play to those strengths. And um, I don't know, I think I operate more on that level, you know? I can see that. Yeah. Kurt Russell's in a, one of my favorite movies of all time, Tombstone. Yeah. Tombstone, love that. I, I, I'm a, my favorite movie of all time, uh, Big Trouble in Little China. I love that movie to death. Love it, love it, love it. Um, love it but, but kurt russell you know he's constantly good i mean even yeah, he is. nowadays you know um i i can't say i cared for the hateful eight very much but i like kurt russell in it and did you ever see bone tomahawk no i haven't seen that oh one. see yeah. that today when we get done go watch bone tomahawk it is so good okay it's such a great western and kurt russell's in it. um so even steven this yes. is this is his origin or it's yeah, it's, it's his first or his appearance. De his really debut. His origin. And yeah, you, will you continue his story in, in uh, M2B? Where, yes, where it is guaranteed that he will tell us his origin. Well, one of them. Uh, you know, I mean, so. You're doing that Phantom Stranger thing. I have to say the Phantom Stranger was in the back of my head because, you know, um, even Stephen for those who may not know anything about him, he, um, he's a character who's defined more by his philosophy than by his power, you know? He has really virtually unlimited power. If Galactus showed up, even Steven could match Galactus blow for blow. And if even Steven is fighting a drugstore thief, he will only be at the power level of, of a drugstore thief because even Steven feels that good will always triumph over evil in a fair fight. So psychologically, he can never let himself be stronger than the person he's up against. Never. Okay. So, um, so anyways, I find that very interesting. He's defined by his, his philosophy, not by his powers. And um, so when people started saying they love this character, wanted to see more about him, I'm like going, 
I, I think he works best as an enigma. You know, he really, the less we know about him, the, the better. And I was like, going, how do we write stories about this guy? And I did think of the Phantom Stranger and, uh, you know, that brilliant issue of Secret Origins where they showed three, like three different origins for the Phantom Stranger. And that's the four. only way to show four. I'm sorry, yeah. four. That's the only way to do the origin of Phantom Stranger. Which one is your favorite? I, I can't say I remember any of them right now. I just okay. remember they were all different. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, I love that issue. So because because I was like, because uh, it has four very distinct stories. Yeah. And they're all really good. <laughs> Jim, no, also Jim Aparo, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. <laughs> you can't complain about any of that. Can't complain about any of it. Yeah. No. So that's the that's the road we're going down with it, with even Stephen is you know we will in the next imp, in imp two b imp two b um, uh, impossible Jones Captain Lightning team up book one of the stretch goals assuming we get there will be uh, a, an even Stephen solo story which Dan has already agreed to pencil and ink if we get if we need to include it and it'll be one of his origin stories but. Uh, you know, he's, he's this enigma. He's, he's an, you know, there's this large uh, section of urban myth around him. And, you know, these people believe one thing, these people believe another thing, and there's no definitive answer with, uh, with him, you know, there just isn't. So here's a, here's a, here's a question about that. We, when you did Imp 2A, uh, Imp and Holly, you know, you had a very set goal for, for Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was going to give us what twenty-five pages or something. If what was you, it? It was uh, if you had met just that 20, goal. Yeah, it was twenty-six. I think it was a twenty-six-page story originally, and then David added two more, so it became a twenty-eight-page story. And yeah. then um, with the stretch goals, right, we get to thirty-seven. Thirty-seven pages. Uh, we had six pages. Uh, well, 36 pages, 30 pages of Impali and six pages of even Steven. I think I'm more wondering about the economics of the f and how much Kickstarter flexibility Kickstarter gives you in terms uh, of how much more you're able to add. Well, uh, obviously, you know, um, it gives us a lot of flexibility. I mean, I can't remember exactly what we set the stretch goal at. But we actually had two because at first it was a four page backup and then we added two more pages to six pages. But um, I mean, at that point, we had raised enough money to pay ourselves at least a livable wage and cover the uh, printing costs. And that's that's what we have to have to do. Uh, and so then you figure out a four more pages. Um, if we raise this much more money, we can pay ourselves to do these extra four pages or these extra six pages. Um, and so that's what you do. That's how you set the stretch goal, you know? So everybody back this to the stretch goal, because I want to see part two of this even Steven story. <laughs> I do too. I'm very interested to see what one of his origins is. And of course, if there's a third, there will be an imp to see uh, a third book in the, in the series. And that could have another of his origins, which will star Polecat. Uh, that will, yeah, not in the even Steven story, but yeah, the polecat will be the, yeah. in the the main draw. The main story will be polecat and uh, and uh, impossible Jones. So will even Steven be imp two D? If there's a yeah, when we get to two D, if he would be a stretch goal again. Yeah. Wait, so who would she team up with in two D? Well, that 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 might be a long story. That originally it was going to be a brand new character. Um, called uh doc victory tm okay i'm still going to use the name um but she's she's a character i've wanted to do for decades which is she's a doctor who treats super powered characters so she knows how to treat you know fire and elemental if he's still on fire but is bleeding or something like that you know she knows uh how to yeah. treat these sort of characters i, I think that could be really interesting and Marvel and DC have never been very interested in it, so I want to do it here. And in the uh, in the graphic novel, we make reference to uh, the, the shock center, the shock docs. And yeah. that's that's who these are. They're the people trained to deal with superpowered uh, wounds and things. And my plan was to have her in the fourth issue, Doc Victory. And that I was planning the third story would end with Impossible Jones being. Uh, hurt badly and go right into the fourth part where she's being treated for her, her injuries. Um, but 
there, there came a moment where I started to see, and I, this is where the stories write themselves. I actually started to see that, well, I've got issues, you know, the third part and the fourth part are linked. And then I, I came up with an idea that actually would bring in the Captain Lightning story, part two. And, um, and then I said, well, is there a way to tie in the Holly story? Which at this point was done. It was already yeah. done. And I suddenly thought, oh, I do know how to tie in the Holly story. So all of a sudden, these four independent stories have actually become an arc. They, they have become an interconnected arc. And, they, and because of that, the end, the fourth part, there was no longer any room for Doc Victory because the arc became really, really big at the end. Um, and it will feature a character, uh, another new character who's not been actually, I don't think she's even been mentioned in the books yet. And she's named U.S. Angel. And U.S. Angel is the Captain America sort of patriotic hero of the imp universe. Um, and, uh, you know, she's the, the reason she I was always going to bring her in anyway. But now she's got a much bigger role to play because she is a uh, polecat's long unrequited love interest. <laughs> they, they grew up together. They grew up together and she like hit it big. She hit it big. And he's like just this small time hero in the city. And, you know, she's working at a level far beyond him. Um, anyways, but I wanted to explore that relationship. So now the fourth part, Imp 2D, will be Impossible Jones and U.S. Angel. And I'll tell you one really interesting thing about U.S. Angel is I created her when very, for a very few short days, for maybe a couple of weeks, I was going to draw uh, Cullen Bunn's Beyond Mortal comic which okay. was on Kickstarter a little while ago. In fact, I think they're shipping the book out right now. I can't wait to get it. But for a few weeks, I was the artist on that project. And one of the ideas I put on the table was U.S. Angel. And then things shifted around in my life. I got a chance to do Impossible Jones with David instead. So I said, Cullen, I'd love to do this, but I, I want to do Impossible Jones more. And so we parted friends. And one of the things we did was we split up the characters. And I kept U.S. Angel. And U.S. Angel will now show up in Impossible Jones. Awesome. That's awesome. That's great to hear. I am. It is insane that it wrote itself because I know you intended to write them as four separate standalone stories. And now they're all going to tie together. So this the end at the end of Imp 2A is not actually the end. No, I mean, like I said, it's I, I guess it's like life where, you know, you have Monday and then you have Tuesday and then you have Wednesday. And on Thursday, you realize something that happened on Monday comes back. You know what I mean? And that's kind of how it is. Now, when you say that you have these, um, you had these stories, these three stories, but you were wondering how the Holly story was going to fit in. And then it clicked how the Holly story was going to fit in. Mm -hmm. And earlier you said Krampus is coming back sooner than you expected. Are those two statements linked? I, 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 I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> yeah, um, my last question for this is, um, I know you are in a studio called Helioscope. Right. And... In that studio also is a couple named uh, Paul Tobin and yeah. uh, Colleen Coover. And oh, I love those people. Yeah. And they have a comic book called Bandette. Yes, they do. Which is about a thief mm -hmm. whose best friend slash arch enemy is also another thief. Did you guys plan this? Did you? No, I did not. I mean, I have to say, uh, you know, I like, I love Bandette. I, I've read the first two volumes. I haven't read the third one yet. I don't know if there is a fourth one. I've fallen a little behind. I love Bandette. And uh, I actually only this morning saw a post which compared uh, Impossible Jones to Bandette. And I thought, oh, that's right. They are both kind of, you know, thieves, good hearted thieves, you know, that sort of thing. It was never my intention to walk, uh, you know, on their the path that they blazed, you know. They're I mean, two completely different books. They are they are there are similarities, but there's there's yeah. there are differences. Yeah. yeah. Um I I love what they do with Bandette. Um it I told Paul at one point that you know the first time I ran read Bandette, it was like this book seems like it should have been around forever. It was just it just seemed like it should have existed before they created it. It just was such a perfect idea, you know. That 
That's what I said about Impossible Jones. I know it is. Isn't that odd? <laughs> but I, I, I remember telling Paul that um, about Ben Dead. It just seemed like that idea just should have existed even before they did it, you know? So. Yeah, I mean, superficially, they're, they're similar. But, I mean, y- you have you have this very superhero type it is a superhero book very superhero type feel they're more on that type i think that more asterisk tint in bd yeah yeah no it's it's much more european and feel yeah and it's wonderful that way it's wonderful that way yeah and and it's great so uh that's a lesson to everyone just because two things sound the same doesn't mean they're interchangeable (laughs) no that's true and i would highly recommend ben debt to anybody I, yeah. and, and I think, you know, I think anyone that likes comics would like Bandette, but I do think if you like Impossible Jones, you will like Bandette also. That is true. I have them both. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Carl Kiesel. Always a pleasure. Uh, everyone go to impossiblekickstarter.com. Yes, right now, please. Yeah.